Episode 7. A photograph says a thousand words. The day following Pierre's emotional breakdown proved altogether mundane. Though Maka again began having her meals alongside him, and though they went for their regular walk around town, they talked a little. It would be nice to say that simply breaking down in Maka's arms after presuming the light from a kitchen fridge was a portal to another world would be the sort of fairy tale occurrence to bring the two unbreakably closer together and offer them to get over all their emotional hang ups. However, real life is seldom that simple, and so they had spent the day blushing sheepishly at one another and only speaking around in circles on topics like the weather. The second morning after they made up, almost 36 hours on exactly, was proving to be quite similar. They had had a relaxing breakfast and now the duo found themselves in Pierre's living room. The space was the sort one might look at and think of a 1990s TV set, faded wallpaper and soft reds and yellows, pieces of ornate furniture and an old box television. The parlour was situated across from the dining room on the house's ground floor, and as such had the same corridor-style layout, with a, dis- a disused fireplace to one end, and metre tall windows against the exterior wall, letting in a glorious amount of early morning sunlight. Pierre sat in an old and worn armchair, reading the daily paper as delivered to his doorstep, though in truth he did more awkward glances in Maka's direction than actual reading. For her part, Maka floated around, admiring various objects in the room. She had taken something of a liking to the antiquated television, but today both she and it were silent, as the slightly off atmosphere between the two continued to hang over them like an axe. 60 seconds, 100 seconds, 150 seconds, tick tock, tick bloody. Pierre, what's this structure? Maka's voice cut through Pierre's thoughts like a most welcome scalpel. As nonchalantly as possible, Pierre laid down the newspaper to look at what she had indicated towards. It was the model of some techno-titlon pyramid. The souvenir lay proudly at the centre of the mantelpiece, crafted from actual rock in the area. It was a fine-scale modern of the ancient New World Monument, with its square layers creeping into a pyramidal point. Hmm, ah, yes, an Aztec pyramid. Fascinating people, you know, built these amazing cities and worshipped some interesting ideals. Pierre said. And these two? Marker beckoned, pointing towards two other structures. Uh, the one on the left is the Eiffel Tower, in France, and to the right is an Egyptian pyramid, Pierre recited like some tour guide. Marker nodded appreciatively. They're all, um, triangles. Is, uh, is that important? In an instant, Pierre felt the air change and the tension fade. He smiled and then laughed loudly, springing from his chair. Marker blushed. What? Did I ask a silly question? No, no, it's a good question, Pierre said between laughter. He strode over to a picture hanging on the wall and pointed for Maka to look at it. This here is a photo I took of Stonehenge. When I first arrived, it was one of the places I had an interest in. Of course, with time, I've discounted it. Just some burial grounds or religious site. But when I first arrived on Earth, I had no way of knowing that. I'm not sure I follow, Maka replied earnestly. Pierre nodded. All of these are places and structures I investigated when I first arrived here on Earth. He took Marker lightly by the shoulder into the hallway and began pointing to places on a map affixed to the staircase's exterior surface. Pierre had seen her looking at the map before, the type where the world is laid out flat with all the country's names written on it. Considering her almost photographic memory, she had probably already learnt the names of every place on Earth, but he pointed to specific places nonetheless. This here is uh, the Bermuda Triangle. Back in the 90s, it was still a big deal. Planes and boats seemingly went in and never returned. It it couldn't be penetrated by radio signals. Oh, and this here is predicted to be where Area 50... Pierre, my friend. Uh, Yes, Marker. You haven't answered my question. If anything, I have even more now. Ah, right, good point. Well, put lightly, when I first arrived... uh, Pierre hesitated for a few moments, seemingly considering changing the topic, but then he pressed on. Well... Put honestly, things were they were tough. I didn't speak a word of the language, and I didn't have a penny to my name. I spent longer, uh, well, a longer time than I would have liked sleeping in <laughs> shop doorways and down cold street alleyways. But thankfully, it turned out I wasn't the only one who couldn't speak the language. Even to this day, many foreigners come here for work. They pick fruits, work in packaging, food factories, drive lorries, a bit of everything, really. And like me, some of them didn't exactly speak much English. So I got myself little jobs, blended in as some sort of foreigner, moving around the country and slowly learning odd words of English here and there, along with a few quid to call my own. 
And after that, you became a storyteller, Maka added enthusiastically. Ha! If only it were that easy. No, I'm afraid, Maka, it takes a bit more than that to become an author in this world, Pierre said, and then began to trace a line throughout the continent of Europe on the map. I went backpacking, crossing from country to country. My aim was simple. If I got transported here, then perhaps something could send me back. He gestured his hand to more souvenirs and framed photos of famous landmarks around the corridor. Oh, now I see. And uh, what did you find? Pierre frowned. <laughs> Not a lot, I'm afraid. Oh, sure, this world is full of mysteries and unexplained locations, but none of them all seemed that helpful. The Aztecs were the closest I ever got. Their structures of their pyramids are very similar in style to one I remember from back home, but nothing ever came of it. Magi don't seem to have ever existed here, well, except for you and me, I guess. Oh, do you still travel? Maka asked, a little deflated. Mm, oh, God, no, I gave that up years ago. <laughs> Decades now, I suppose. Maka reeled at the awkward turn the conversation had taken, searching around herself for a change in topic. Uh, um, did you, uh, did you say you made these f photographs by yourself? My good man, I presumed a specialist of some kind was needed to create these. Pierre broke from his dark musings. What? Oh, yes, they're just Polaroids. You know, that camera is probably still here somewhere. Well, then, you must show it to me so we might take one of these pictures, Maka said, clapping excitedly with almost childish glee. Up to. So it was that Maka half pushed Pierre up to the second floor where, just across from her own bedroom, in fact, Pierre introduced Maka to his storeroom. A part of her did wonder what the logic of having such a room on the middle floor of the house was, but these thoughts were quickly replaced by ones retaining to the room itself. Despite being on the aforementioned second floor, the storeroom very much so looked like an attic. It was packed to the brim with cardboard boxes and junk. So full, in fact, that only a sliver of light made it through the window, the rest covered by more piled-high boxes. Cobwebs lined everything, and a layer of dust coated the floor. Ah, uh, excuse the mess, I tend to just throw things in here, Pierre said briskly upon seeing Maka's expression towards the room. But surely you need to come and retrieve things from here, yes? What? Oh, no, not often. Never looking back, Marka mumbled inaudibly under her breath with a deep sadness. Pierre began to rifle through the room, shuffling past the stacked items, his grey hair giving him a sort of natural camouflage among the dust-laden place. Marka stuck near the entrance of the room, peering cautiously into some of the closer boxes. I found it! What, what, what are you doing? Pierre said worriedly. An angered look had come over Marka's youthful face. Are you not ashamed, Pierre? What is the meaning of this? She exclaimed while holding up a small box of books. Around her feet were dozens of similar boxes. Pierre rose an eyebrow in confusion. These boxes are full of your own books, man. They say your name on them. You have been increasing your own popularity by pr purchasing your product. Despicable, she proclaimed overly dramatically. Pierre found himself laughing again, only to look up at a pouting marker. <laughs> Don't be silly, woman. That would never work unless you were a billionaire or something. Those are all for copies. The publisher sends me five or six copies every time they release one of my books, to be given to friends and family, that sort of thing. Marker flushed a bright scarlet of realisation. Ah, well, how was I to know? It is your fault for putting them all together here suspiciously. Why have you not handed them out yet? The question hung in the air silently until the answer dawned itself on Marka. She did not press for an answer. Instead, she took out one of the novels from the box. You said Undercurrent was your most recent work, the one about where we come from. But these others, what are they? She questioned as casually as she could, to try and once more steer the light-hearted conversation back on track. It was Pierre's turn to have his cheeks redden. Oh, hold on, don't read that one, he pleaded, trying to push his way back to the front of the room, still surrounded by the boxes. Too late, Maka had begun to read aloud. Follow the adventures of the great hero and her four companions in this thrilling instalment as they head to slay the mighty dra- Pierre? Yes? You said the rest of your books were fictional, made up. And yet this sounds awfully like one of our adventures back in the old days. Pierre turned his eyes away from her insinuating glance. <laughs> they, they do say, write what you know, and <laughs> no one in this world is any the wiser, he mumbled. Marga grinned stupidly before grabbing up more of the books from the boxes around her and making a run for it. Hey, hey what are you doing? 
Bring those back. No one said you could read those. They're just fiction, I tell you. Any similarities to real events are just coincidences. Fiction. Marker, come back here, girl. Pierre yelled after the girl with the silver hair, his face growing ever more crimson as she laughed her way teasingly down the hallway. And so it was on the 9th of February, just a mere five spans from a certain special day, and more than 20 years after his initial purchasing of the large London townhouse, that Pierre framed his first photo containing people rather than objects. A photo taken on an old, chunky black Polaroid camera, an image of a man and a woman, one with silvered hair and the other grey, a portrait of the two standing next to one another, with the girl leaning in against the man, a finger poking his cheek playfully as the man tries to keep his facial expression composed. A photo of two happy and sincere smiles. It was also the first time Pierre ever gifted someone an author's copy of one of his books, if a little begrudgingly. Episode 8. To Fly Beside the Sun Look, there it is again, Marco exclaimed, pointing in the distance to the looming shape of the London Eye, that massive white ferris wheel accenting the London skyline. Pierre had noticed her interest in the thing the last few days, and begun to wonder how long it would be until Marco demanded a closer look. Oh, still where we left it. You know, I really doubt it's going to roll away when we aren't looking, Pierre jeered coyly. Marco's face point pouted. Ha, <laughs> very funny, wise guy. Pierre laughed lightly at her embarrassment. They were making their way down one of the many shop-lined streets of the city, the type that in a smaller town might have been a main street, walled with smart-looking business fronts and their pinstriped canopies, as throngs of people made their way up and down, though by London standards it was little more than a wide alleyway. They rounded a corner with coffees in hand, as though it was second nature, automatically making their way to the same old park they regularly frequented, the one with the circular gravel path which on a bright, clear skyed afternoon like today was filled with joggers and dog walkers. As always there was the faint smell of fried foods coming from the ever-present ship van, and to either side of it was the same two benches as always, though today no one sat on the bench in the shade of the old beech tree. As they took their usual spot on the one to the left of the van, Marcus struck up a new direction for the conversation. So listen, I've been reading those books I found in your storeroom. Pierre groaned audibly. I told you, it's all fiction. It, yes, well that's nice and all, but I have questions. Well, no surprise there, Pierre grinned. But haven't you heard of uh, Death of the Author? You're not meant to ask questions about a text, you know. Marco frowned. There'll be a Death of the Author right in front of me if you don't stop teasing. Uh, fair point. What was your question? Pierre retorted with hands raised in full surrender. Marco nodded, pleased to get back on track. The character, who is quite clearly meant to be you, when you were still my knight, as uh, still, I mean, uh, your Lady Ardic's companion, is she meant to be so, uh, so lonely and un in inadequate? Pierre nearly choked on the cup of coffee he'd been drinking from. Ah, uh, yeah, that's quite a loaded question. Well, characters need arcs, you know, to keep the story interesting. So that part isn't based on you, Marker replied with hope. Uh, well, Pierre half mumbled, casting his eyes aside. For a few seconds, it seemed he would try to change the subject. But then he continued, much to Marka's joy at seeing her friend open up to her more often as of late. I, I guess when I was a, a kid, I thought I was hot stuff. I mean, a boy like me from the slums of the capital, getting to become a royal knight, that's a pretty big deal. It was my father's doing, really. He was a regular old pikeman in the army. But one day he saved his commander, some noble lord, a baron or duke, I think. Anyway, as a reward, the noble offered father a knight ship. But he turned it down and instead asked the Lord to make me one. So there I was, little five or six year old gem, shipped off to be a page, a knight in training. I was good at it too. I'd grown up knowing what not having enough food on the table felt like. I'd go home on leave from training, only to find out the village had died of plague. That sort of life hardens you more than being some nobleman's son. And so I rose through the ranks like a meteor across the sky. That annoyed a lot of actual noblemen's sons, and let me tell you, getting into fights with those makes for great practical training. He grinned before cringing with a sigh. But in reality, I was just a, a very big fish in a very small pond. A couple of years from finishing my training, I got made your, I mean, Ardig's bodyguard and tutor. Everyone knew why. The king thought a commoner like me would slack off. He didn't actually want his child to wield a sword. But you did the training with all you had, Marker added. 
Pierre laughed hardly. <laughs> like I had a choice. Young Harding was a downright diva. The tomboy princess, hair cut short, dressing in boys' clothes, and badgering her father into getting her sword lessons. Trust me, she didn't give me any option but to teach her everything I knew. Then again, she was an amazing student. Marco watched as Pierre's face clouded, as he remembered a long-forgotten history. A memory of two teenagers sparring with wooden swords, the boy with a cocky grin on his young face, and a hand held behind his back. The girl, if she could be confidently identified as one, drenched in sweat as her short brown bob flowed to and fro as she desperately tried to best her teacher. I, I said before that I believe Ardick had a photographic memory, but maybe it was more than that. She learned with a ferocious pace. In weeks she had mastered basic form, sword forms, and by the time I was ordained an official knight of the realm, in just those short years she had already caught up to me, learned everything I'd spent the better part of fifteen years on, in barely two years with me. The memory moved, no longer a teenager but instead a young man sparred, now with blunted metal swords, the wooden ones long since shattered. Now it was him whose rough, poorly shaven face was covered with sweat, as the seemingly unaging young girl pressed a relentless, swirling flurry of an attack against her sparring partner and former tutor. That was the thing I learned. That I was nothing more than a meteor passing by. A brief spark of nothingness. But Ardic, she was the sun. A blinding hot white supernova of a person. A demigod amongst humanity, destined to change the world forever and be remembered for all history. The NTME proves it. Even thousands of years after her death, she is still remembered on the biggest feast day of the year. Her empire marked the turning of the first age into the second. She changed the course of history itself. Pierre finished, a mix of sorrow and awe plastering his voice. Marcus shuffled a little uncomfortably next to him. Whether he accepted it or not, she still claimed to be that very same Ardic, if a younger version, making Pierre's speech quite the embarrassing one to listen to. So you, you really felt that lonely back then, when, when we adventured together? Hmm? Oh, not at all. I was the one who everyone treated normally. A sword master with the power to detect changes in the weather, Pierre said, laughing at his own power's absurdity. But your power was useful, and, and you stuck by her side more than anyone else, right? Pierre smirked. Marka, I watched Ardig repel entire ar armies, single-handed, with the use of her battalion of flying swords. The best my power, magi powers could do was make sure everyone always knew when to carry an umbrella. Marka did her best to suppress a smirk at this last comment, which caused Pierre to start laughing again. <laughs> Barometric pressures is something they have studied here on Earth. I believe that's what my ability is. Like cats or dogs, I can sense when a storm or an earthquake is coming. Not an entirely useful thing in daily life, but certainly not much compared to Ardig. Marka frowned, unable to properly think of a counter-argument to Pierre's logic. She wanted to say all powers and warriors had their place and were important to a team of adventurers, but struggled to find the right phrasing. She had noticed this often about Pierre since that night when he had broken down in her arms. He was certainly more open with her now, about his past and his feelings, which she felt was a good thing, but that openness brought with it a great deal of sour memories and sorrowful thoughts, things Pierre had kept to himself for a long time, expressing his feelings only cryptically through his writing. After work on this deep hell sadness before Valentine's Day gets here, Mocker lamented internally, but even as she did, Pierre had started off on more reminiscing. Don't get me wrong, though, I, I don't begrudge her or anything. That's just the way of the world. You can be someone important, maybe a famous hero who slays a great monster, one who gets remembered for generations to come, but eventually even that will fade. <laughs> you can hardly expect the world to remember everyone who ever lived, now can you? No, only a select few get remembered forever, like Ardig. If anything, my biggest regret is probably being made to leave her behind. I know it sounds arrogant. I mean, look at the sun. Look up at it. Can you relate to the sun? Empathize with it? Ever hope to burn a fraction as brightly as it does? Of course not. But a part of me was content back then to at least be able to catch Ardig when she used her power too much that I could at least make sure she never got caught out in the rain. Silly, really, I know. The sun doesn't need a passing meteor's kindness. And yet, she always seemed so lonely to me. I watched with a deep sadness of her own as Pierre continued to vent, 
He sat staring up at the clouds, his hand laid flat against the surface of the bench. She slowly reached out her own hand to his, suddenly filled with a deep-seated urge to join with him. But you were important. You were the reason I wasn't lonely. The most important... Pierre hopped up from the bench with a start, clearly not having heard what Mocha had been mumbling under her breath, and inadvertently missing her hand reaching for his. Enough of this depressing talk. Makes me sound like some old man on his deathbed, Pierre proclaimed, stretching his stiff shoulders. I fancy chips. Oh, and a, a battered sausage, eh? Healthy eating be damned. What about you, Mocha? Mocha sighed and pushed herself out of the chair, before offering the same smile as always. Sure, but you're paying. Take it as punishment for that missed opportunity at happiness just now. I always pay. And what missed opportunity? <laughs> if you miss what's right in front of your eyes, you have no one to blame but yourself, she jeered gleefully, smirking as she skipped ahead of Pierre, her white head of hair blowing gently in the cold February breeze. Pierre smiled as he followed after her. The cost of a meal was certainly a small one to pay for this type of happiness, even if he didn't wholly understand Mocker's meaning. Episode 9, Empress of the World. Pierre stirred in his bed as he slept, not the restless movement of a nightmare, but the simple shifting of someone deep in a dream. Your Highness! Thank goodness it's you! You must stop them! Quickly! It's improper! whined the shrill voice of a small man with poor complexion and a ferreted face. The woman he dressed so fervently was none other than Her Highness, first saint of the one church and the greatest empress of all Valia, the Lady Ardig. She stood intimidatingly atop a small incline, with people going out of their way to give her a wide berth and bow incessantly when required to walk past her. She ignored them all. Beneath her, at the bottom of the slope, was a field of sand used for the outdoor training of guardsmen and the like. She herself was a greatly imposing figure to behold. A pair of platform boots elevated her stature, a suit of heavy silver plate armour embroidered with gold and crimson adorning her torso, and an emerald green kilt at her waist, with a fluttering red cape fixed to her mantle. Her hair was a startling shock of white cut short and braided neatly. Her expression was near blank, two staring scarlet eyes, a dainty nose and a mouth that looked to be little more than a thin straight line. I must do what now? She looked down at the small man who had spoken to her. The tiny man looked fit to faint at her question, at the realisation of what his own words had been. He flustered in a cross of bowing and spluttering. I, I, no, 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 I, I, I mean, that is to say, they, they must, they, yes, they must, not you, of course, my lady. I, I meant they must stop. <laughs> Ardick's expression remained completely level, though internally she marked the man for further observation. Few of her servants were brave enough to speak so openly to her. This man might yet have a promising future. She turned her attention back to the training ground below, at the sight which had ruffled the attendant. Two men stood there, one with sword drawn who periodically charged at the other, whom himself simply stepped to the side or pirouetted away with vigour. A crowd had formed to watch the strange confrontation. Ardig's stony expression, with its fixed points that would give challenge to the visage of a statue, finally broke as the faintest of smiles graced her lips, the smallest curving at the edges of her mouth. Let them do as they will. After all, this is not the best way for men to settle a debate through strife, no. Jim Havler, vice commander of the Royal Knights of the Realm, effortlessly jerked back from the passing stroke of the enemy blade. Across his rough, stubble-lined face spread a wolfish grin. It was a face that seemed more fitting for someone in their late thirties rather than a man in his twenty. Ha <laughs> ha man! That the best you can do, boy! He laughed triumphantly. The boy was none other than the new captain of the guard. A young lad, barely out of his youth, with well-combed golden hair and a clean-shaven face, all complemented by his silver and white uniform and a far too ornate sword. It didn't take much for the onlooking crowd to disconcert the cause of the argument. There was always a bureaucratic rivalry between the knights and the castle guard, both directly under the direct command of the empress, both charged with her safety, and both vying to pull rank over one another. The young man's face had become puffed and sweaty, you fiend, sir! You fiend! You will refer to me by my title, you cur! He bellowed before once more charging at Jem with his sword held overhead, in turn leaving himself wide open. 
Jem laughed again before finally drawing on his open blade, a far more practical and sharper looking weapon, and parrying the incoming attack with ease. He struck back the younger man's blow with such force that the guard captain began to stumble backwards. Jem, however, strove forward. He wound up his right hand and sent it straight for a hook to the young captain's face. A cheer rose up from the crowd. The captain clutched at his face where the blow had landed, a faint line of blood dripping from his nail-busted lip. You, you scoundrel! What sort of move was that? He demanded indignantly. Jem laughed once more. <laughs> you think you can protect our lady with that attitude? Think every assassin will ask your permission nicely before poisoning her wine or throwing a dagger at her late at night, hmm? The captain swung wildly in Jem's direction to little avail, Jem simply ducking under the blade, flipping his own into a backwards grip and then ramming the pommel of the sword into the blonde-haired youth's solar plexus. The young man gasped painedly from the winding as his sword arm fell limply to one side. However, before Jem could make another move, the boy finally struck back. Despite his winding with all his strength, the boy rammed his free elbow into Jem's crouched back before jumping away to recover. Jem half fell forward, catching himself just short of meeting of a meeting with the floor beneath. He stood back up with a grin while rubbing his now sore back playfully. Ha! So there is some fight in you then, boy! You shall not call me boy, you mongrel commoner! There was a booing from the crowd at this comment. The captain reddened hearing this. Silence! All of you! I am the son of Avernia's highest ranking duke, damn it! You will address me with the respect that title requires, you blasted commoners! Jem's expression lost its joviality at this last comment. The boy captain drew up his stance, sword gripped tightly in both hands once more, his lips still drooling blood and one eye beginning to swell from Jem's earlier assault. He charged forward with all his might towards Jem, kicking up sand as he went. But the older man had seemingly lost interest in the battle, lost interest at the mention of noble entitlement. In a single flush movement, almost too fast for the eye to see, the sword master known as Jem Havler easily stepped aside the incoming strike, before in a move much like the one just, just used against him moments earlier, he rammed his own elbow down with an almighty pressure against the captain's passing body. The blonde boy crumpled to the floor, his face buried in the dirt, unconscious. A raucous cheer arose from the now four score or more gathered in the crowd. Jem stared down at the now thoroughly defeated captain of the guard. The boy who should wash her mouth. You speak now as emissary of her lady, and you shall do so with the respect and decorum of all her people. A ruler is only as strong as those who follow them. You would do well to remember that. Another cheer of public appreciation followed this comment. Jim turned to address the crowd of watching servants and lesser guards, thanking them and then bowing like a showman. A trio of similarly white and silver dressed guardsmen made their way through the crowd, two going to aid their fallen leader and the third approaching Jim. Uh, my lord, the generals and admirals have at all last arrived. The meeting is to be held now. Yours and the, uh, the captain's presence are requested, the guardsman said with a sidelong look at his splayed out superior officer, and then one to the space behind Jem. Jem's followed his gaze to where he met her eyes. At once his expression changed back to one of the utmost merriment. As his wolfish grin returned in force, he bowed again, this time specifically for her. Of course, he had known she was there all along. He could sense her in a manner of speaking, but still, he couldn't help but smile at her sight. Very good. About time we went on a hunt for that blasted cannon, eh? Last place on the continent that has yet uh, accepted a vinely ordained rulership of our great lady. Uh, you're dismissed, soldier. See what you can do to bring the cap back around in time for the briefing, eh? Jem instructed to the messenger before lightly jogging away in Lady Ardig's direction. He quickly made his way up the little hill to her side. And how are we this fine day, Princess? P -p princess You dare call her highness Princess? shrieked the attendant, who still stood by her side. Jem offered the short man a raised eyebrow in response. <laughs> he shall always be the princess in my eyes, he laughed casually. The attendant looked as though he might faint on the spot. He smiled a very quiet affair, but unmistakably on her usual expressionless face. That was quite the mean thing you did to the young captain, old friend. She said in what might just have been a joking tone. We all need to be taught a lesson sometimes, Jem said back a little sheepishly. Then perhaps you and I should go a few rounds then, Sir Havler, Ardig added slyly. Jem's face flushed. <laughs> well, now that really wouldn't be proper. Anyhow, the meeting, yes, we must head there post haste. On that subject, how do you plan to handle things? 
He had whispered these last words in a fashion that the attendant could not hear. There is no way an army can take that blasted weapon, not without great bloodshed. Great weapon of the Eastern Alliance, a group of four countries, the last four anywhere on both the central and southern continents, who still held out against Ardig's empire, now that the Vernia had willingly joined up by choice following the Battle of Last Bridge just months ago. Their conquest of the Alliance should have been a trivial matter, until the day had come when they had eviscerated an entire forward army with a blinding white searing pillar of light from the sky, a city's diameter and scope that had left nothing of the forward army behind but a crater in the ground. Ever since then the Alliance had rallied its remaining forces, an upward estimate of seventy thousand to one spot, the great city of the ancients, a place of sacred temples of unknown purpose, left abandoned for centuries. The ancients, being a race of people who had simply vanished thousands of years ago without a trace. It was obvious then what the source of the enemy's great weapon must have been, something left behind by a culture long gone. The question now facing Ardig's empire was how to force away true the last enemy army who could oppose her rule, while avoiding being blasted by this reality-breaking secret weapon in the process. Ardig's response to Jem's question was to allow her smile to grow ever so slightly broader, it filled Jem's heart with glee to see, ever since she had begun her conquest of the world, since she had begun to more frequently rely on her amazing magi powers, she had in turn grown ever more distant, more reserved, as though the cost of using her ability was her personality, her identity itself. But at last, around him, she would smile and even crack the odd sly remark. An army could not get through, perhaps, but a strike team? led by a certain saint, her knightly bodyguard, and their golem. Or maybe they could, no? Jem's face broke into a wild grin of its own. It had been far too long since they went on an adventure. Ha <laughs> ha, milady! Oh, then allow this humble knightly bodyguard to escort you to the meeting, will you not? We've got some convincing to do if we're going to pull this one off. Jem laughed as he offered his elbow to lean upon on their way back to Ardig's palace, where a dozen marshals of her various armies and fleets awaited her every command. Pierre lazily opened his eyes. Another dream, he contemplated. Ever since the night he had had the false nightmare wherein Ardic had died on the field of battle, his dreams now seemed to move in a pattern. Every second night he would have a nightmare, ones that always ended in either Ardic or Mocker, or on one confusing occasion both, leaving him in some fashion before he would awaken with a start. On the nights in between he would have dreams like today's, Peaceful memories of a time and a life long since past. He'd begun to wonder if his acknowledgement of this pattern was in itself the very thing causing the strange occurrence. Dreams are tricky things to manage and interpret, he mused quietly to himself. He reached for his bedside notepad, now filled with a week's worth of detailed recollections. As he flipped through the pages, a selection of words was circled on each one. Ardek had short white hair, an expressionless face, an almost masculine body type and deep crimson eyes. He dejectedly laid down the notebook, not bothering to write down today's dreams. Once again, the details have been the exact same. Even in the nightmares, the Arctic of his memories, with her subdued personality and expressionless face, differed greatly from the fun, bubbly and caring girl who now lived in his house. He stared up at the ceiling. He had fully accepted that Mocker was a good thing for his life, and a person he wanted more than anyone else to be around all the time. Still, there's just something not right here. Just who are you, Mako Miss? The calendar next to his bed read February 13th. He always changed it just before going to sleep. Therefore, today was the last day, the last day before Valentine's Day. Pierre sighed and threw back the covers. He had things to finish planning for tomorrow, and now had time to lay about contemplating frivolous dreams. Episode 10, Growing Feelings of the Pair Pierre's study was a somewhat lavish affair. Wood panelled walls lined with packed bookshelves, his leather-bound armchair, only having recently been repaired, his large mahogany desk, a small sizzling fireplace against one wall that filled the room with a homely roasting smell, a small area for making tea, and of course an ornate hanging wall clock. The clock filled the packed room with a subtle series of ticks and tocks. On its face the time read 20 past 11. The room was the very same place Marker had first appeared out of thin air, almost exactly two weeks ago to the hour. 
Now she sat in her usual spot upon a plush four-legged stool with its back to one of the bookshelves, rocking gently to and fro as she interrupted Pierre's efforts to fill out his journal for the day. Oh, come on, man. Just one little clue can't hurt, can it? She cooed. Marker, if I've said it once today, then I've said it a hundred times. You should simply have to wait and see. Maka pouted playfully. Since when did you become such a tease? Just one little horror hint, yes? Pierre sighed. Mark had spent the entire day asking for clues and hints on what exactly he had planned for tomorrow, for Valentine's Day. Look, if I tell you something, it can only lead to dissatisfaction. Overhype, that's what the PR people call it these days. When a product promises too much and ends up being a disappointment. Mark looked slightly lost, so Pierre continued his explanation. All right, think of it like this. Imagine you and your um, adventuring party got word of an evil army of 400, heavily armoured orcs under the command of a, an evil magi. Now he had her attention. Mock had sat up eagerly as though already formulating a plan to fight this imaginary army. And you spend the week getting there, coming up with your battle plan and so on. However, when you arrive, it turns out the message was wrong or mistranslated, whatever. Instead of 400, it's 40, and they're goblins in leather armour rather than orcs, all under the command of some children's party wizard rather than a magi. Now, how would you feel about that? She frowned. That would be stupid. I'd be most perturbed. Exactly, Pierre finished plainly, turning his attentions back to the ledgers and diaries on the desk in front of him. So why not head off to bed, and you'll find out all about the... The... The date? Maka grinned. Pierre flushed red. Our, our appointment tomorrow. Maka sighed, leaning her head back against the bookshelf behind her, with her arms holding the base of the stool. Oh, no fun, she mumbled childishly, but then her face puffed up again. Say, Pierre, how come you get to plan it all, eh? Maybe I should plan some of our Valentine's date. I wish you wouldn't call it that. Anyway, it's the man's job to court the woman. Maka's face turned to one of pretend shock. Pierre, my good man, I didn't know you were a misogynist. A fit of manly coughing filled the room at this comment. <laughs> Why, where in God's name did you hear a word like that? The internet? Ah, uh, yes, that makes sense. Maka laughed. I'm only kidding. No need to frown like that. I know you meant no harm. Plus, it's not like I know this London town all that well. I'm sure I'd have n no ideas of where to take us, even if I was the one planning. Yes, well, I suppose that's true. Hey, Pierre, is this your first Valentine's Day? The older man's hand held in the air, his pen dangling above the paperwork beneath. I said it before, right? Valentine's is for children, not adults. But yes, I, I guess it is, if you must put it like that. Oh, I didn't realise, Mark said a little surprised. But it's not like it's my first rodeo or anything. Indeed, back in the day I was quite the ladies' man, I'll have you know. <laughs> Wasn't a girl in the kingdom who didn't want to be with a man of my knightly physique. He boasted, puffing out his now greying hair and old man's body with pride, as though he was still twenty years of age. Maka looked even more surprised at this remark, but before she could comment, Pierre started once again, this time talking as he stood up and made his way over to the small tea-making station in the corner of the study. No, I suppose there was only ever one I actually uh, loved. She watched as he set the kettle to boil and drew down two cups, filling them with cocoa powder. I didn't ask for a drink, Mr. Ladies' Man, Maka jeered. Pierre grinned. Who says I'm honoring? I just happen to be making two cups worth. She smiled softly back at this before leaning forward and laying a hand to her chin. Say, uh, the one you l who you really liked back then, did you ever tell her how you felt? A pained look came over Pierre's worn old face. Uh, no, I'm afraid not. I, it, was, it wasn't that simple. We were always off fighting one battle or another. There was never much time for such things. In the stories, there's always time for romance. Yes, well, real life tends to be a little more intrusive. Pierre laughed a little bitterly. Marco clutched her hands together as though bracing for an expected answer. Did you... did you think she was ugly? Too much of a tomboy? Pierre nearly dropped the steaming cup of hot chocolate he'd been carefully carrying across the room as he burst into a fit of light laughter. <laughs> what, what in God's name would have that to do with anything? And of course not. I mean, sure, she wasn't nearly as feminine as a girl like you are, but that was never the problem. Me and her, well, it was complicated. As he handed her over one of the cups, a thought suddenly dawned on Pierre. It was one he felt incredibly ashamed to have not had sooner. 
one that seems so obvious. This girl in front of me. All this time I've been simply worrying about her leaving me all alone, worrying about myself. Yet right here is someone with her own hang-ups and worries. For all your happy nature, are you hurting underneath too, Marka? He smiled as he laid the cup down on the table next to him and retook his chair, resolute in what he'd ask next. That word you said earlier, misogynist. Back when me and her lived, well, we didn't have words like that, ways to express ourselves. It's funny, really, but Balya and Earth mirror each other in that sense. We had no way to talk about things like sexuality or gender. In all honesty, I really did sleep around a lot with many different women. But not so much because I wanted to, or even found much pleasure in it. But more like I had something to prove. Like, to be a normal man, I had to get with women, to prove to myself as much as anyone that I was normal. And, and that wasn't... <sighs> It wasn't a me problem. Maka nodded along attentively as Pierre continued. She knew all too well the feeling of not fitting into a society properly. The girl was in a way the same way as me, and yet completely different. I really mean it when I say I don't know what gender she was for sure. She took such great strides to keep it hidden from everyone around her that I struggled to believe she wasn't doing so on purpose. I mean, who knows? Maybe she was a boy born into a girl's body or vice versa. Maybe she was simply a tomboy, you know. But we didn't have words like transgender back then. And heck, even if we did, we could have hardly used them in our positions. I've had time to think on it since arriving on Earth. Thirty years' worth of time and postmodernist human knowledge. They have words here for everything you can imagine. Labels. Perhaps I'm asexual to some degree, or demi, or grey, or maybe Arctic had gender dysphoria, or had no interest in any sort of relationship whatsoever. All of them might have fitted how we used to feel, but honestly, I don't think I ever wanted to put a label on it. If she had actually been a boy underneath that armour, or a boy born into a girl's body, or any other configuration, I don't think any of that would have changed my feelings towards her. All I really know is this, I, I loved her, and no one else in my entire life as much as her. In turn, I'm sure Ardick loves someone in her own way as well. Whatever labels the two of us belong to hardly matter, does it? Ultimately, we were what we were, and we loved who we loved. So, um, no, it had nothing to do with her being tomboyish. <laughs> that never even factored. And no, I haven't really had any partners since coming to Earth. There was no longer a need to pretend, you see. Me and her, we just, uh, well, we just never really properly got a chance to express our feelings, I suppose. Before I got brought here, Pierre finished quietly. Maka's face had gone a deep crimson shade. Pierre soon followed suit as silence cloaked the small room. You... you, you said Ardig. Ah, uh, Ardig was the girl you loved, Maka squeaked. Oh, wait, wait, now, hold on. That's uh, that is not what I meant, I are. Uh, what about you, then? Do you like anyone back home, eh? Pierre fought back the presently, trying to cover up his mistake. Maka's face grew somewhat more bright red far warmer than the drink she held cupped in her hands. What? I... I... Uh, um, may, maybe, but... Uh, well, he's younger than me, but he looks older, and, and I don't think he looks at me like that. At least, I didn't think he did. But, uh, but after what you just said, Maka muttered with a schoolgirl incoherence. Silence fell again as the two simmered like sweethearts. Finally, Maka sprang to her feet, glancing at the clock. <laughs> I've passed already. I, uh, I better be hitting, hitting the hay. Pierre's eyes followed her sheepish progress across the room. <laughs> right, of course, yes. I must be going at a night soon myself, he said. The girl stood in the door for a few moments, hiding her face's massive grin from sight. So, um, thanks. I, uh, I think I needed to know that. About the tomboy thing, I, I mean. Uh, good, good night. And with that, Marker half sprinted away. Pierre felt up to his own face, to his warm cheeks. He had only meant to comfort Maka's insecurities about her tomboyish appearance, not to go and confess his own feelings towards Ardig. But I guess Maka is. The clock struck ever nearer to twelve, to Valentine's Day. Episode 11 Valentine's? Is that some sort of date? 
There is, Pierre would have to admit, one great advantage to your only magical power being the ability to detect changes in the atmosphere. Useless on the battlefield, most of the time, sure, but for planning a date? For knowing exactly when to make a quick stop at a cafe just before a passing shower drenches everyone else on the street? Now that, he could admit, was useful. February 14th, two long weeks since Mocker's arrival, Valentine's Day at last, and Pierre had plans, quite a lot of plans in fact. In some ways, planning what to do on a date with Mocker had not been that difficult. He simply picked out all the activities he had avoided doing these last few weeks. And so it was that they set out to see everything that great old city of London had to offer. They strode across Tower Bridge, that most expansive crossing of the mighty River Thames, that pushed and rushed and gushed beneath, bridged to the either side with massive pillar-like towers. They stood in front of the House of Commons, Big Ben, the Tower of London, and of course Mocker found a great appreciation for the Queen's Guard who stood in their bright red uniforms and tall black chimney hats in front of Buckingham Palace. And they took pictures with everything. Maka insisted on doing so. The old Polaroid camera taken from Pierre's storeroom had never seen so much action in its life. They dressed well, Pierre in his finest coat and boots, Maka in her brage flock and a dainty skirt, beneath that with a slightly out-of-season wide-brimmed sun hat atop her flowing white hair. And they travelled, oh they travelled, in every form of transport they could find, in classic London black cabs straight off the television, to the underground tube lines and even the public Boris bikes famous in the city. Marka's face was alight with delight at each new method. She had watched cars and trains these last two weeks, but to actually ride on them was an experience in and of itself for the girl out of a medieval setting. They stopped at cafes and stalls for tea and cakes, lots of cakes in fact, as Marka insisted on eating a lot of chocolate, something about honouring the traditions of St Valentine. And then they finally arrived at the one place they had both known they would have inevitably arrive. It's even better up close. Told you it wouldn't roll away, Pierre laughed. Marka attempted to pout, but struggled to hide her raw excitement. Jokes like that make you sound very old, you know, she teased before turning her attentions back to it. The London Eye, a massive white ferris wheel that dominated much of the skyline of the city, all on the banks of the river and from atop overlooking the sprawling landscape beneath it. Were tickets hard to come by? Maka asked. Hmm, ah, well, I suppose so. Usually we have to book months or even years in advance, especially on Valentine's Day. But that, what's the point in being a celebrity if you don't pull the odd strings, eh? People were falling over themselves to give me seats, thank you very much. Pierre yeah, boasted proudly. Maka smiled. Then my thanks is even greater. I hope it wasn't too much trouble. Pierre yeah, blushed at her earnest gaze staring up at him through her chestnut brown eyes. <laughs> no, 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 no trouble at all, really. <laughs> Maka just smiled in response to his embarrassment. And before long, they were at the t front of the queue and taking their seats aboard one of the oval-shaped carriages of the Ferris wheel. A carriage all to themselves, of course. What a perfect view it turned out to be. The clouds had all but cleared to give way to an afternoon sunshine. The sky almost glowed its serene Cheyenne shade. And there it was, the thing Pierre had secretly hoped to see most of all. Her smile. Not that it took much to cause Maka to grin kindly, but this was ever so slightly different. This was a look of utter, pure joy, a toothy grin and bright-eyed expression of true happiness, curiosity and wonderment. Of course she had been up high before, he'd been with her then, or at least with Ardek that is, when they had scaled mountains to slay dragons, and then there were all the tall castles and palaces she had lived in. But this was truly something special. A unique feeling us humans only ever gain from the exhilarating moment of being moved through the sky, whether by aircraft or like they did now, to watch the world slowly grow smaller beneath you, to look out with more perspective on everything you never realised, just how much you know and love. And to Pierre, that was the most sobering part of it all, a part of what made him feel so very enthralled by Mocker's every action. We often miss the beauty around us, not just in majestic cities or beautiful rural villages, but in all places, even the most run-down or decrepit of settlements will have some small corner of beauty hidden beneath. Wherever there is life, no matter how small, there is some wonder to behold. He knew it to be true now, for Mocker had shown it to him, that he had spent thirty years ignoring the beauty of Earth. All those places he had seen and things he'd done had all just been an effort to return home to Balia, to the beauty he had lost so long ago. But Mocker was different. She took everything in, all of it. She asked questions, poked, prodded, laughed, and tenaciously learned. She picked up on everything and appreciated the beauty of it all. 
which in turn made her the most magnificent centre of everything. Do you think we can see our house from up here, Pierre? I hadn't thought of that. I, I suppose it might be possible. He laughed back in response. She could fly in that blue sky that surrounds us now, and those feathers of beautiful red and white, and how beautiful she would look doing so. As they finally disembarked the machine and began to walk again through the city streets to Pierre's next mystery location, Marco reached out to grab for his hand. This time he did not dodge, though he did blush, as they walked hand in hand down the pathway. That man is a crook, I tell you, a crook! Three hundred pound for the two of us? Three hundred? Pierre exclaimed. There, there, my good man, you didn't have to order quite so extravagantly, Marcus said, patting Pierre on the shoulder soothingly. They walked now down a narrow enough alleyway, having had their evening meal at London's most flamboyant, and apparently most expensive, restaurant. The city was now lit by the last dregs of dusk light. It might be February, but the sun still set before seven at that time of year, and now the warm glow of the street lights began to spring to life. Leaf mucker, who in their right mind puts bloody gold on a stake? And what's with that thing he was doing with his hand? What sort of way is that to spread salt for all that's holy? Pierre, your heritage is showing, Marco jeered coyly. My what? Your short hands and deep pockets, man. Your economic attitude towards spending. She winked, grinning wolfishly at the further blush that's brought to Pierre's cheeks. Uh, well, yes, I, I suppose it is a special occasion and all that. Still, gold leaf on perfectly good steak marker. The two laughed about the exuberant price of things in the city, all as they rounded a familiar corner and found themselves in none other than that place. Marker giggled, a giggle that no longer weirded Pierre out, but instead seemed perfectly natural now. It would appear, old friend, that we have wandered back to our favourite spot by complete accident. <laughs> we are like homing pigeons, no? Pierre concealed the knowing grin. <laughs> Indeed, whatever are the chances. Well, as we are here, we might as well seat for a moment, shall we? They had made their way across to the two park benches, the ones with the black and grey chip van between them, the same old public park, just a short distance from home. Well, except for one large discrepancy. It would seem even the proprietor of this shop is not around. I have never seen this place so quiet. Mock amused, reading a piece of paper duct-taped onto the front of the food van's closed-down shutters. Ed, out looking for love, all hints on its whereabouts are welcome. Ha! You can't still be hungry, girl. What? No, 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 of course not, Mocker reddened. It's just that it's, it's too quiet here, that's all. Almost like we have the entire park to ourselves. Hey, this isn't your doing, is it? Some elaborate ruse to, to snog me under the old beech tree? Pierre appeared to choke on his own spit. <laughs> snog? What sort of word is that to use in the company of a man? Mocker giggled again, and even Pierre couldn't help suppress a fit of laughter. They walked over to their usual bench, the one not under the old beech tree, thank you very much, still hand in hand as they sat down. A rest after the full tour of the city and all the food they had had was most welcome indeed. I must admit, Pierre, you're not half bad at showing a lady a good time, Marka smiled. Really? And this is only the tip of the iceberg. Wait till you get to see the lights at Christmas. The whole town lit up like the feast days back home. Oh, and there's Halloween. You can walk around in your whole night's regalia, and no one will bat an eyelid. All Hallow's Eve, they call it. And then there's Easter. Now, that one really is for kids, but I'm sure you'll find the Easter egg hunt they host in this very park to be a most heartwarming sight, you know. They hunt for eggs. Uh, well, chocolate eggs rather than actual eggs. Chocolate eggs? Now, surely you must jest. Ha! I most certainly do not. Oh, and St. Patrick's Day is pretty soon, too. We could get a ferry across to Dublin. You'd love the ferry, I'm sure of it. And Dublin on St. Patrick's Day? Well, the streets are full of these massive parades with huge carnival-style floats. And everyone dresses in bits of green while drinking absolutely too much. To be honest, Valentine's is probably the least interesting holiday of the year. You've seen nothing yet. Marcus squeezed Pierre's hand a little tighter and leaned in her head against his arm. Perhaps but I think Valentine's will always be my favourite. Why is that? He replied while flushing bright red at her closeness to him. She's so very warm. Because, silly, it's the event I got to spend with you. Dee, don't you mean the fur? Pierre's words were cut off as a whining sound cut through the sky. Soon following it came the thunderous boom of a red sparkling light up above. Mocker's eyes glimmered once more in pleased surprise. 
Next followed a green rocket that made a diamond pattern, then another in a blue triangle, a turd in yellow circles, then five all at once forming together to make a massive, multicoloured star in the sky above the rooftops. Yeah, look! Aren't they beautiful? So many and so close! It must be fate that we were passing as this happened. Pierre averted his eyes a little, fully aware that it was far, far from their fate. Another barrage going up in a staggered line one after another, like someone running their hand along a keyboard. Crimson, gold, emerald, azure, magenta, one after another, dazzling shapes and intricate formations, enough to make even the illuminators of ancient China envious. What's the point in having a three-story house in the middle of London, if not to use it as a firework display platform, eh? <laughs> I bet the police will be heading to my front door even as we sit here now, Pierre thought to himself. Pierre? came the soft voice beside him, barely audible over the continued whine of more fireworks above, though they must surely be nearing their end. Mm -hmm. One hand still clasped to Pierre's, the other lay gently on his knee. Maka pivoted up and kissed Pierre in earnest. Not a snog or a peck. No, a simple kiss of the utmost honest kind. The warm locking of lips together, the physical transmission of feelings held most dear. The numbing effect as though the flashes of light and bursts of sound all around them had faded away. A momentary union of complete isolation. Just the two of them in the world for a short fleeting moment. United. Just a simple kiss? Maka moved back when it was done. Staring up into Pierre's shocked, wordless, and most of all kind eyes, she leaned in again, this time up to his ear, as the last firework made its lonely path through the sky and erupted in a shower of red and white diamonds. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you so very much. Episode 12, Ardig and Gem, Part 1 Maka leaned in again, up to his ear this time, as the last firework made its lonely path through the sky and erupted in a shower of red and white diamonds. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you so very much. Goodbye, Jim Havlet. The world seemed to swirl uncontrollably around Pierre. One moment he sat on the park bench, watching fireworks with Maka kissing. The next it was all black. Goodbye. Pierre panicked. He felt his blood quicken. Tried desperately to look around himself. Was the room pitch black? His eyes blindfolded? Was he asleep? Before he knew it, his eyes shot back open, and the world re-enveloped him. His mouth moved by itself. Behind you! Ardig! It was there she stood, a ways in front of him, dressed in her finest plate armour, her signature red cloak and emerald green battle kilt, and her blade drawn in a fierce clash with a far less opulent foe. She quickly took heed of Jem's warning, raising one heavy clad boot and kicking out hard against the enemy soldier's stomach the small man being sent sprawling onto the floor with a pained grunt. Before she had even finished a kick, Ardig's crimson eyes glowed an even deeper red than usual, with a seamless pirouette on her heel of equal menace and elegance to face the threat that Jem had warned of. Charging at her was a middle-aged, ferreted man, dressed in civilian researcher's clothing, and clumsily charging forward with what appeared to be a soldier's short sword. From the way he was running, the sword was most certainly not the man's, but that was no reason to underestimate someone. Just metres away from the semi-dull blade colliding with Ardig, the man suddenly stopped and collapsed to his knees. Ardig's own sword now found its way to his neck. The reason for his stopping? Ardig had simply used her power to remove the sword from her attacker's hand. One moment the civilian had been desperately charging with all his might and resolve, and the next he had looked down to see his sword had literally flown out of his hand and hit the floor with a harmless clatter. Happy that the untrained man wouldn't try stabber in the back a second time, I'd have turned back to the other man she'd kicked a moment ago and stared as though into his soul. A lightly armoured, ragged soldier had picked back up his own sword and stood with a decent stance, but Jem, who by now had made his way over to the trembling civilian, who was starting, who was staring longingly at his empty hands, simply hoped the enemy soldier would do the sensible thing and lay down his weapon. As long as he did, Ardick would happily leave the man live. After all, had she wanted to, she could have killed both men in mere seconds, simply turning their own swords against them telekinetically. Have them fly out of their hands and into their throats or hearts or lungs or eye sockets or... She still tries to avoid giving people painful deaths. The soldier continued to look between his tightly gripped blade and Ardig. The air was tense and time seemed to move slower as the man made his choice. To die what he perceived as doing his duty or to live as a disgraced warrior. Jem was almost about to open his mouth and try to talk down the enemy. All around them were corpses, dozens of them, and more outside this building, enough for one day. 
But before he could, the soldier made his choice. He charged, yelling with everything his tired lungs had left to give. Alec stepped to the side expertly and, effortlessly, brought down her blade. The enemy's head rolled off cleanly, his body following quickly after. Decapitation. A method of death that hurts the executioner more than the victim. Except if it fails, of course. Nothing worse than a guillotine that stops halfway. But Ardick never fails. An instant death. Nice call, Ardick said in her usual flat tone. Jem smirked mirthlessly, in the middle of binding the civilian man's hands. Not that there was much need. Watching the last friendly soldier in the room get decapitated had been more than enough to break the small man. Ha! <laughs> like you needed it! A man that weak hardly posed a threat, and I doubt this here jester would have even scratched your armour. Ardick's lip curved downwards. Jem, he might have had dependents. You should not be so callous. Dependents? Not family or loved ones, but dependents, Jem thought to himself. He had hoped getting back to the battlefield might break Ardick out of her shell a little. The plan had gone perfectly. Any plan of Ardick's always did. A squad of ten, himself as leader, the golem as his second, and Ardick as empress, simply observing her forces in the field. At least that's what they told all the marshals who insisted it was insanity for her to enter the battlefield, even if she had already racked up the most kills. Along with seven others of Jem's personal choosing, they had snuck their way past the Alliance army and into the sacred city of the Ancients. They'd taken out more than half the local forces before the alarm was even raised. Ten against a hundred is not such bad odds when you have the element of surprise and a knife in the dark. Maybe not the most honourable way, but if they should succeed today, they would save a lot more blood in the long run. And yet, rather than being pleased at their victory, Jem felt uneasy. More and more lately, he felt it. It was many years since he had been that hapless boy at the Battle of Ten Thousand, since that day when he'd been unable to even stand by her side as she slew the entire enemy. No, now he knew he could at least guard her. He knew he was the best swordsman on the continent. Only Ardic herself could best him with a blade. And yet the more years went by, the more that felt irrelevant. Here was his oldest friend, speaking through an almost blank face, with the words of a machine rather than a person. What the hell is happening to you, Ardic? And how do I help you? Before he could apologise for his comment on the dead soldier, one of the others from the party came charging, charging in. Youngest of the group, the boy had been automatically picked as squad gopher, the one tasked with running messages despite a heavy set of armour on his back, underneath a camouflage cloak. Havle, my lady, he said, immediately going down on one knee to bow. Jem saluted back. What is it, lad? Speak freely. Yes, sir. The Tsar, I mean the Lord Golem, sir. He said the main alliance army has started to move in our direction. Thirty minutes before the main force is on top of us, sir. Even less for the scouts. Jim cussed under his breath. A golem's eyes are never wrong. Before looking over to Ardick, she nodded before speaking. Teams of two. Check each building quickly. We have this one. The younger man glanced up at Jem, as though looking for more elaborate orders. You heard her, didn't you? Pair up in teams of two. At least one sensitive or magi in each group. One team to each of the smaller temples. Me and the, prin uh, the Empress will take this central building. If you find something, do not try and activate it without reporting back to us first. Relay that to the Golem. He'll, Golem. He'll handle the parents and coordination. Understood, son? The sacred city of the ancients was living up to its name. For miles around, there was the rubble of ancient houses and other buildings. But central of all was the five temples, four of them surrounding a larger fifth. The four were three layers of metre-tall stonework in height, each individual block carved with intricate masonry detail and massive sections of inlaid metals and rare gems. But the central temple was the most impressive of all. It dwarfed the already impressive height of the other four, spanning up into the clouds. Like the others, it was made of large square stone layers, ridging into a pyramidal shape as each layer of square was narrower than the last. Even more gems and metals lined this temple, and large, fine work staircases tracked up each side. Ardick led the way up these stairs to the top level of the pyramid, Jem close behind, dragging his prisoner by bound hands. They entered the top floor with haste, the golem's warning of an incoming army fresh on their minds. The top floor was different to the others. If, for no other reason, then it was empty. Everyone had obviously left when the alarm, a series of massive bells, was raised, probably all lying dead on the floors below. But aside from that, the room also was empty of objects. In the centre was a blinding pillar of white light, presumably let in by a window in the roof for sunlight to be magnified in some manner. Along the world's were terminals of glass or precious rock. Jim wasn't entirely sure. 
Other than that, there was almost nothing. Even the researchers didn't seem to have left anything behind. It wasn't, that wasn't to say it was normal. There was a warm, hazy feel to the place, possibly because of the sunlight pouring in. Further, there was an odd taste to the air, a faint oxide to it. Feel it too? Ardig asked after a moment. Yup, looks like this place is definitely magical, and probably the source of this weapon. At the mention of weapon, the small man Jem had been dragging about suddenly became lively again, speaking for the first time in the same language in his, as his captors, if more broken. We we weapon No! No, no, no! Weapon! Danger! Dangerous! Jem's eyebrows rose a faction. <laughs> so you're finally awake! Uh, and yes, dangerous is the general idea of giant cannons that turn armies into smoldering craters. Uh, hey, Princess, you want to check out these panel things while I have a little chat with our friend here? Ardick nodded her approval, and the two set to work. Well, you get all that? Jem asked while gesturing his hand towards the now unconscious and somewhat more bruised prisoner. Summarize, Ardick said back. Jem sighed. All right, from what I could gather, this is the cannon's control room. It takes two magi to fire, one standing like a lemon in the column of sunlight, the other having to focus their mind, imagining the place they want to shoot at, I, I think. And, and bam, you got yourself a new lake on the map. It doesn't much explain how it works or where it shoots from, but maybe this place is connected to heaven or something. Uh, you know, that blast that comes down is from the gods, maybe. Makes as much sense as anything. Jem finished and enthused. Jem, you're not religious. Ardick, in what might have been a taunt, said back. Princess, you really shouldn't say that out loud. You are a saint, remember? She shrugged. Magi amplification. You gonna explain that a bit more? Ardick shrugged again, and Jim sighed. Well, don't matter how it works. Let's get it going, eh? I'll hop into the light, and you... A grip like iron took hold of Jim's wrist. He said it was dangerous. Jim grinned. So you were listening. He was trying to stop us from using it on his mates. Anyway, you're the only one with perfect memory, right? You can fire this thing close enough to the Alliance's main army without hitting them. If me or one of the others were to fire it, we would probably end up blowing up some small town by accident. Jem pulled his wrist free and stepped forward again, only for Ardick to lay a hand on his shoulder. Use him, she said, looking at their captured researcher. Jem politely removed her hand. He ain't a magi. You of all people would have sensed that if he was. One of the others? It wasn't a question. Excuse me? Jem said, his voice growing harsher. I can sense one coming. Sixty seconds, Ardick proclaimed completely casually. You mean one of my subordinates? Princess, I ain't about to go throw some kid into this thing, you hear? I'm your bodyguard. It's my job to do this stuff. I don't need you to protect me. Ardick's face took on a faint hint of frustration. Irrational. Your value nets higher than your subordinates. Jem's face flushed with anger. How dare you talk about that, about our troops? Some of these guys have been with us on multiple campaigns, across entire continents besides you and me. They're not units on a board. Can't you talk like a human for just a second? Ardick cast her gaze down to her feet, not saying a word. Jim Rue rubbed loosely at his scalp. Sorry, that was sorry. Look, we'll be fine, okay? Only you can safely fire this tank. And even if the researchers were afraid of the light, that doesn't make it deadly. Or how would they have put it up with it? I don't know. They'd have had a do not cross this line sign, you know? Jem leaned over and took Ardick's head into his arms, unable to remember the last time they touched one another like this. A gasp from her confirmed she was thinking much the same thing. I haven't been a very good friend, have I? When we get back, let's... My dear Sola, let's talk properly when we get back, eh? Once we have this cannon, we're done, right? No one else in the world can oppose your empire. Not this magic of the ancients. Even it didn't stop us. So let's talk properly about things when this is done, all right? And I'm sorry for leaving you alone for so long. Right now, let me do this much for you. At least this much. And like that, he pulled away and jumped into the pillar of light before Ardy could grab him for a third time. He could have sworn he saw her mouth the words, but you're already the one who's always here for me. I'm... Before the blinding light obscured his vision. Jem, or no, is it Pierre? Floated in a seemingly borderless white void. What was I doing? R right, Ardig, helping Ardig, wasn't I? The, no, the void, the, the white pillar, the ancient's cannon. I stepped in and then it all went to, to fireworks. 
Uh, Makar or, or Hardig? Wait, are they the same? No, they're different, I'm sure of that, right? Red eyes. Where am I? Hardig? That isn't even her name, is it? Not really. Maka Umash. What does that name mean to me now? A car horn sounded loudly, and finally reality flooded back to Pierre. The horn was so familiar, an old Ford van. Right. I, I stepped in, and next thing I knew, I was in the middle of London. Uh, in a street, being yelled at by the driver of, of, of a van. But that was thirty years ago, and, and that memory. How could I have forgotten it? Or had I forgotten it? Pierre rubbed his forehead, trying to get his bearings. The park bench he was splayed out on. Around him there was just street lights, and in the distance the sound of car horns, the very thing that had awoken him. I fell asleep? Damn, I really am getting old, napping on a date. He grumbled, standing up and stretching his arms awkwardly. Marka? Marka, are you around? She hardly left for home without me. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you very much. Goodbye, Jim Hafler. The words rang through his head. Marka! Marka! He was running now. He wasn't sure when he had started running, but he had no intention of stopping. Unlike the park, the rest of the town was busy with Valentine's couples on their way to dinner or heading home for the evening. Some even pointed at Pierre, recognising him from interviews and such like on his books. Through the alleys and past the shops, they had frequented every day now for two long weeks. Two fun weeks of banter and quibbling and endless questions. Two glorious weeks he hadn't known he'd needed so badly in his life. And in the final corner into his own street, the long broad place of expensive three-storey townhouses. And there in front of his own house, a squad car with two young officers standing by his front door. One talking into his radio receiver, as though asking for some sort of backup. Fireworks! Damn, they got here fast! Or was I asleep for that long? Pierre didn't dwell on this inconvenience long, edging his way along the house to one of the many tall windows on the fourth floor. One he deliberately left unlocked for if he forgot his keys or if the front door stuck closed. Carefully closing it behind him, he found himself inside the parlour, and there on the coffee table lay a note. A letter, really. Pierre's heart sank. He shakily picked it up, reading it in the dim glow of one of the street lights shining through the window. It was long and written in a somewhat scribbled way, indicative of a rush. Pierre traced his finger along the words, skipping between paragraphs. Sorry to put you to sleep like that, but all going well, you have now remembered our final moments together. You were right about those Aztecs. They didn't just build similar temples to our world's ancients. The two are one and the same. The ancients all disappeared one day, the entire race, to Earth, like you did. I'm sorry it took so long. I used the Empire, the one we built together, found people from all across it to research the temple, to find a way to get you back. But there isn't one, Jem. No magite on Earth. There's, that's why the Aztecs never returned to Bolia. It's impossible. They get stuck, just like you. Eventually we learned... The, the temple's original purpose, not as a gun or a teleporter, but a looking glass. A way to look out at distant stars and worlds, like Earth. In a way, a primitive version of the NTME, but gone wrong. Two weeks, that's all that can be done now. There isn't enough magic left here. Moving the ancient's entire race, firing the cannon twice, it's all drained it. Using my own magic power, I was able to get a few weeks out of what's left, but... After that, the portal may never open again. You must understand, Mock is me and I am her. She is simply a side of me I never got to show you back then. She's the idealized version not from your head, but mine. She's the way I wish I could have looked, the way I wished I could have talked with you. She's just a projection of me that the temple gave life. I must return now. Not only is the Magite losing its last sparks, but further I'm unconscious for as long as I project Mocker's image to you. It will not do to leave my empire unattended any longer, even if it's for you. And don't hold this against young Maka. She knew nothing. Like you, she had dreams, hints of real memories, but really believed herself to be a younger me, one from before things got so complicated. Me and her are fully combined now, hence my writing this letter. Do not mourn her. She will always be within me. In fact, she insists that we visit her, no, my favourite place, one last time. She'll wait until you enter the house, and then she'll leave when you're not looking. My reasons, Jem, for all this are simple ones, and they're selfish ones. I've spent years, thirty of them, 
fearing what happened to you, hoping against hope that you were not dead, but also that you lived, that you moved on. My last request of you is therefore that you don't let this be the end. Take what Marcus showed you and, and live your life, my old friend. Go out there and find someone. My wish, dear Jen, is that if this temple still has any power left, that in one year's time I can look in at you on a Valentine's date, that I can know you won't spend the rest of your days alone because of me. I hope you understand. I hope this experience was for the best and that the good Marka did will outweigh the hurt I know you must be feeling right now. And to prove once and for all this is me, I shall sign with my true name. Dear Jim, please live long and well. All my love, farewell. Sola. Pierre's voice caught as he read the final lines. He wiped tears from his eyes, scrunched up the note and stormed over to the fireplace. You damn idiot! He roared as he slammed his fist against the mantel. As the heavy impact landed, a faint clicking sound and the wall of the fireplace slid back slowly. Pierre reached up into his hidden compartment, retrieving two old and tarnished steel soldier pieces, a worn leather breastplate and a scabbarded sword. You're not going anywhere that easy, he muttered as he put on the gear for the first time in many decades. And with that, he charged over to the front door, swung it open with the determination to bring Ardig, Sola, Mocker, or whatever damn name she's going by, back this very instant. The door opened. At the bottom of the steps, the now eight police officers, four of which looked suspiciously like armed police, stared up at Pierre. Pierre closed the door. Ah, right. Bollocks! Bonus episode 12.5 Ardig's letter to Pierre Havelock Appendix 1 Dear Jem, or rather should I say Pierre, I don't believe Marker ever asked you which name you prefer. At this point you've been going by Pierre longer than you ever did, Jem, yes? You were what, 27 or 28 when you departed my side? That would make you nearly 60 now, and I'm sure Marker would tease you to no end had she discovered your age. Time is short, and there is much I must tell you, Pierre, much that you have a right to know. I want these last two weeks and this letter to be your resolution, to answer every question you may have, so that you can move on from it all. Move on from the undercurrent. Firstly, sorry to put you to sleep like that, but all going well you have now remembered our final moments together. It is a technique I have only learned in the years since you left, an ability to drag out a distinct or heavily guarded memories from other magi, in doing so putting them into something like a trance-like sleep. Heavy-handed method, I'll admit, but I needed for you to see our last day together, again, for your own good, to move past it. You were right about those Aztecs. They didn't just build similar temples to our world's ancients. The two are one and the same. The ancients disappeared one day, the entire race, to Earth. That's what the temple really is. The canon was an accidental byproduct. I've learned about m the place in the years between our parting. I believe the ancients were an entire race of Magi sensitives, who knew the magical properties of Magi. City, these temples, they're laced with it. I have no doubt in my mind this is the largest above-ground collection of the radioactive metal on the planet. Indeed, I don't think there'll ever be as much in one place again. It's in the walls of every brick, every house, shop, and of course it's rampant throughout the temple walls and even the floors. I'm sorry it took so long. I used the Empire, the one we built, found people from all across it to research the runes and relics, to find a way to get you back. But there simply isn't one, Gem. There's no Magi or Gavnu, as they call it now, on Earth. That's why the Aztecs never returned back to Balia. They made new temples, but without the Magi it was impossible. They got stuck just like you. They used the same building techniques, found precious resources, resorted to pagan rituals even, but none of it worked. They were trapped forever. Eventually we learned how to use the temple for its original purpose, not as a gun or a teleporter, but a looking glass. That's what the ancients actually wanted to create, a way to look out at distant stars and worlds, like Earth. In a way, they created a very primitive and yet mind-bogglingly powerful version of the NTME. So much more than that. This much radioactive material in one place is the sort of insanity born only of ignorance. The ancients had no idea what they created. Their goal was to project themselves with a body that could touch and taste and feel. But what they actually created, what they made, was the very thing I guessed, uh, guessed way back then. A magi amplifier. The one who steps into the light pillar becomes a conduit, as it were, and the temples form a giant circuit board of sorts. In essence, the Magi has their latent physical psychic powers multiplied by a factor of thousands or more. You know, 
Had I been the one to step into that light with my level of magi ability, it's possible the resulting blast would have destroyed the whole world, maybe the whole solar system. It would have, at least, knocked our planet off its axis in a way you inadvertently saved us all from our own ignorance that day. The cannon could have been anything, too. I and the Alliance researchers who fired it that first time both simply imagined a godlike smiting ray from the heavens. The temples amplified that through the power of the one in the light beam, and, well, bam, space laser, as the Earth humans might say. However, this temple is old now, Jem. Used once to move the entire civilization of the ancients to Earth, twice more to fire the cannon, and presumably mo move both you and one other to Earth. And now to allow me to project myself as Mocha, as originally intended. Much like a uh, filament in a light bulb, with each use the Gov new here loses some of its potencies. I have attempted to gather more. The amount worked into ornamental weapons like our swords or even woven into tapestries is incredible. But for every Magite sword I bring here, I gain perhaps a second or two's worth more time with you. There simply isn't enough in the world to replace the amount the temple once contained. Except, perhaps, within the Dwarven strongholds. But even I could not conquer that city, not even for you. Weeks. That's all that can be done now. Using my own magic as a conduit, having had 30 years to properly study how to use it without activating any accidental cannons of mass destruction. I was able to get just two weeks out of what's left, but after that the portal may never open again. It took quite some practice. I used it in lesser forms at first, spying on your world as a ghost with no body, learning the language, how to read and write, and of course tracking you down. The project has been one of the only things that's truly kept me going all these long years. The day you disappeared is lauded as my greatest moment. The cannon fired as planned. We were able to hit an uninhabited place, intimidate the enemy army into standing down, and soon after the Alliance surrendered and disbanded, all while my forces had zero casualties. That's what they say, anyway. Three books, the heralds, the bards and taverns, Empress Ardig's greatest battle, when the gods in heaven above aided in her conquest. Pa! That day was the one I lost more than any other. You dragged through the portal and the golem. It fought bravely, Jem. Pulled off the enemy's armies, forward scouts by itself, while we were arguing over who would fire the cannon. It got damaged because we delayed. Because I was so indecisive and selfish. I've never been able to fix it. It seldom talks in sentences anymore. It shows little emotion. In a sense, it's more akin to a dog now, though it hurts so much to say that. It stays by my side, mind you, all these years. Always with me, silent hulk of bricks and mortar that speaks even less than I do. So with its mind shattered and you gone, well, you two were all that was left of the old crew. There have been few others who would talk to me like a person. They speak to me though I am inhuman, at the last of demigods among mortal men. But of course there is your sister. She still visits me, Jen. She may be the only person I know who still uses my real name and speaks casually enough with me. Her visits grow rarer, I'm afraid. She got old. But she's ever sprightly. She had three wonderful children and, and plenty grandchildren. Oh, and I'm sure you'd love them all dearly, Jem. I have met them on occasion, though they, they too speak to me as empress rather than as auntie. Still, they are wonderful kids. She lives in a village to the south, a quiet place. A good place, I made sure. Your father was there too until his death. It was a good death, Jem. No disease, nor war. He died, surrounded by his family, a couple of weeks after his first great-grandchildren were born. Peacefully. I always worried they would hate me. Blame me for your disappearance, but they never did. Instead, they continued to treat me as one of their own. But the journey to South Avernia is long now, and your sister is old. I wish I could see her a little more. She is surely my last confidant. I am so lonely. Everyone around me is ageing, yet I barely do. I'm nearer seventy than sixty, yet I look at most forty. My father under the stress of war, invasion, and having to send his daughter to lead the desperate rearguard armies, lives to be over a hundred. The family records list many of my line who passed a hundred and fifty, and they're still fit at that age, still ruling. I wonder if I'll ever be allowed to cease being empress. My powers are greater than any of my ancestors. It's possible I could live to 200 or more and still be combat capable. Who will be left to watch over me then? I need to simply talk to. I am human. 
regardless of my powers. My bones and mind ache, but they refuse to break from this blasted curse of a power. Elves may live this long, but the human body isn't made for Jim. The pain I feel all over, the loneliness of it all. Knowing one day soon your sister will perish, or the golem will finally give what little life remains in it. Those thoughts plague my long nights. And so very... Apologies, Jen. I got a little disorientated and, and begun writing my gibbered train of thoughts. A side effect of the astral projection, no doubt. I would rewrite the whole letter, but I had little time, so I shall simply cross out the incorrect parts. Please don't pay them any mind. Pay no heed. As for Marka, you must understand, old friend, that Marka is me and I am her. She's simply a side of me I never got to show you back then. She's the idealised version not from your head, but from mine. She's the way I wish I could have looked, the way I wish I could have talked with you. She's just a projection of my subconscious personality, that the temple has given life. She's not so much a Japanese waifu from your mind, but rather one out of mine. She, and I in turn, must return now. Not only is the Magi losing its last sparks, but further I am unconscious, for as long as I project to you. I will not, it will not do to leave my empire unattended any longer, even if it's for your sake. And please, don't hold it against young Maka. She honestly knew nothing. Like you, she had dreams, hints of my real memories, but for all intensive purposes, she really believed herself to be a younger me, one from before things got so complicated between us all. My consciousness is awoken now, hence my writing this letter. Do not mourn her, as she will always be within me, and I find myself surprisingly fond of her childish ways. In fact, she insists that before we leave, we visit her, my favourite place, one last time. She will wait until you enter the house and then leave. By the time you have read down this far, she will most likely be there and ready to rejoin with me fully. I apologise my goodbye could not be in person. But bizarrely, both me and Marka share some few traits. We both seem to hate goodbyes. Then again, she is just another faucet of me, so that shouldn't be so surprising. Her kissing you, that was something I didn't know I had deep within me. <laughs> Indeed, it is strange to talk of Marka as though she were separate to me. Disassociative, I suppose. It's complicated. Things always are with us, eh? My reasons, Jem, for all this are all simple ones. Selfish ones, really. I have spent years fearing what happened to you, hoping against hope you were not dead, atomized by the temple, but also hoping that you moved on. I never could. I'm too different. But you? You went and did it, became a great storyteller, made people happy with your tales. Do you remember when I was still princess and knew my sword tutor? How you told me you one day wanted to retire from soldiering, to be a storyteller. I think you succeeded greatly, my old mentor. My last request of you is therefore that you don't let this be the end. Take what Marcus showed you and live your own life. Go out there and find someone. Don't ever hide in your attic study again. That earth of yours is a more beautiful place than you've given it credit for. I don't know for sure if you'll fully understand all this talk of Magi and Aztecs, but I guess in truth none of that really matters. It's complicated jargon, but then again, that's always been the way with the two of us. Makes a change from you explaining things to Marker, huh? I am Ardic and you are Jem. Let this be the last time that phrase is ever uttered, thought of or written down. Let this be the end of Jem. Move on from you and me. Move on from Jem and Ardic and go live in the real world. As Pierre Havelock, you picked a strong name after all. My wish, dear Jem, is that if this temple still has any power left, or if I can gather enough enchanted blades, that in one year's time I can look in at you and see you on another Valentine's date, that I can know you won't spend the rest of your days alone because of me. I hope you understand. I hope this experience was ultimately for the best and not just my own selfish delusions. I hope that the good Marka did will outweigh the hurt I know you must be feeling right now. And I hope that you can finally move on from the undercurrent and enjoy the rest of your days in happiness. Not alone in that dusty old house. And to prove once and for all this is me, I shall sign with my true name rather than a Saint Ardic. Dear Jem, please live long and well. All my love, Sola. Episode 12, Part 2, Ardig and Jen.
The sound of clattering bashed against Pierre's front door, accompanied by an agitated voice. Mr. Avlock! Mr. Avlock! We know you're in there! We saw you open the door! Mr. Avlock, we just want a quick chat, sir! Pierre cussed to himself. Eight of them! Maybe they think I've been held hostage or something. I mean, eight officers for some stupid fireworks! I don't have time for this! Pierre weighed up his options. It didn't take long. There would be no chance of sneaking back out through the window now that the police knew he was inside. He glanced down at his hip, at the l dull brown wrapped colour of his sword. He had never thought to wield it again for as long as he lived. He studied his breeding in a method of concentration learnt a literal lifetime ago. He stood to one side of the front door, enough that it could swing open without hitting him, his hands on the lock switch. Outside he knew two of the armed response officers were making their way up the steps. They weren't actually carrying live ammo, which came as a relief, but still they wore stab-proof vests and heavy-set helmets. In their hands was what the police lovingly called the Big Red Key, an object with the appearance of a fire hydrant used for knocking down doors. He waited silently in the lightless porch of his house, listening for the sounds of heavy boots on steps and the grunts of the man holding the key, the faint thud as the second man braced himself against the door. Two, one, hey! At the exact moment they swung, the exact second the two police officers put all their force into busting down the door, Pierre let it open. The two men carried by their weight, momentum and surprise, were sent flying into the house's hallway, the big red key leaving a visible dent on the floorboards where it landed. Before the two men could recover from their sudden fall, Pierre shot out and pulled the door closed behind him with a clicking of a faulty lock falling into place. A blasted thing always locks itself. I have to leave a window open to get back in when it shuts me out. About time I used that to my own advantage. Two down. Slowly, Pierre turned round to face the six remaining and highly bemused men and women of the law standing before him. Four were the regular kind in high-vis jackets with the words police helpfully plastered everywhere. The other two dressed in the riot clothing of the armed response crew. Sir, uh, are you all right? How about you unlock that door for our colleagues and uh, we can all have a nice chat over some lovely tea, maybe, said one of the plain clothes officers. Jem grinned laid a hand to the familiar-feeling grip of his sword-hilt, and drew forth his blade. "'Sorry, lads, but I've got somewhere to be.' Pierre launched forward like a tiger. The officer nearest flailed backwards in response, taking out a baton to defend himself. Pierre simply ducked underneath it, flipping his sword into a backwards grip and rammed the butt of the weapon into the unfortunate man's stomach. This first officer tumbled backwards, coughing up spittle and falling to his knees. "'Next!' The second officer drew out a yellow silhouette of a taser gun, while a third edged nearer with a baton of her own, and a much better stance than her fallen workmate. Last warning, sir. We're just trying to do our jobs. Lay down the weapon. Pierre laughed. <laughs> Everyone's just trying to do their jobs, woman. Soldiers on both sides of a war, on a battlefield, are just trying to do their jobs, are they not? A battlefield? Is that what this is, sir? You, you were in the war. We can help you with that, if that's what it is. PTSD is very understandable. Pa! How old do I look to you? I'm not even 60 yet. Thank you very much. And you know what? I've never felt more alive. Pierre roared with manacle as he lunged forward. Officer 2 fired his taser while Tree readied her baton. Jem was faster. While the officers all kept their eyes focused on his sword, his free hand grabbed number 3 by the forehand and dragged her close. The taser hit. Tree's baton clattered against the tarmac beneath. Before Officer Two could realise his mistake, Pierre tackled the now unconscious woman forward into her friend, pinning the smaller man underneath his own colleague. Four and five, three to go, boys! Pierre howled like a wolf in his prime, turning his attention to the two riot police. They stood completely starstruck but ready nonetheless. In each of their hands was a baton gun, a non-lethal weapon used to shoot massive rubber bullets at an attacker. They now raised those weapons. Pierre charged forwards towards them, paced the cordon of police cars faded in the glow of the streetlights. The two fired, massive rounds whistling through the air. Jem leaped, twirled through the air like a man four decades younger. His ancient sword glittered a brilliant arc through the sky, reflecting the light of the moon above as it cut through both projectiles in a single flourish only a swordmaster could have even hoped to pull off. He landed back on his feet right before the two riot officers, the half rubber bullets raining down harmlessly around them. The men reached down to catch Pierre by the shirt collar, but was too slow. Pierre grabbed from the officer's belt his own bottle of mace, spraying an unhealthy amount into their eyes. They flailed back in pain. Don't rub your eyes! Remember basic training, Craig! Don't rub your eyes! 
The other officer yelled across to her friend. Pierre moved towards this second one, mace in hand, sword in the other. The woman threw down her helmet's visor and grabbed her own bottle of mace, tossing aside her emptied baton gun. Let's see how you like this, you crazy old man, she said, partially shouting over the sound of her own friend riding painfully behind them. His eye, her eyes focused on the bottle in Pierre's hand. She almost didn't see him pace forward with a thrust of his sword towards her face. Desperately, she reeled back away. Pierre's strike hit true. His blade cracked the visor's tip, flipping it upwards and allowing him to spray the second officer in the face with even more mace. The two riot officers, now incapacitated as they searched around for something to clean their eyes with, Pierre turned back towards the steps of the house. The tasered officer was still on the floor unconscious. The one he had winded and the one he'd shot with his own friend, <laughs> and the one he who'd shot his own friend with said taser, had both retreated into one of the squad cars, doors firmly locked and screaming into a radio for backup. The faint sounds of tuds coming from inside of the house indicated the two trapped officers would break back out soon. But for now, all that remained in his path was one brave hanger-on, a regular cop, baton in one hand, taser in the other. Number eight. Pierre covered the distance with a simple walk, passing by police cars, mazed riot cops and tasered officers in his wake. He let the nearly empty bottle fall out of his hand and clatter noisily on the floor beneath, eyes locked on the final man. Now, now stay back! I will fire, sir! The boy squeaked. Pierre glanced down at his sword as he spoke. Do you know, lad, what this magi blade does? Please, sir, I'm telling you to stay back. It amplifies. Please, I, I have a wife. She's expecting children. My power, too. Stay back. Predict the weather. The officer stared blankly at Pierre. You what? <laughs> Pierre's fist collided mightily with the man's jaw, sending him spiralling into a stationary car bonnet. Sorry, fellas, Pierre said, shaking his fist from the impact. But I told you I have some place to be. You'll sleep it off by morning, probably. And with that, the rugged, rogue old man began to sprint down the roadway towards his final destination. You said once that some people like being alone. Do you want me to leave you? Of course not, you idiot! Never! Pierre yelled aloud to no one in particular. He was running now, faster than he ever had in his life, down short back alleyways, past confused passers-by, weaving in and out of periodic traffic. Do you think she was ugly? Too much of a tomboy. Ha! Never even crossed my mind! More of Mocker's words seemed to file through his mind now. His chest was heaving in the distance he could have sworn he heard the sound of sirens. It wouldn't take the police long to catch up. Every strike and block you make is infinitely better than a signature in mere pen and ink could ever be, even with three decades of rust on you. He vaulted over an upturned dustbin before nearly stumbling his way around the next corner swung his sword with fervour to cut a padlock free of a gate blocking a path he knew would shorten his journey. You are my friend still, no? Or has thirty years shaken our bonds so much that you would abandon me in a world I do not know, dear Jim? I'll never abandon you again, dammit! Sweat seemed to drip from every pore now. His lungs felt like they were ablaze with the strain. Did you feel so embarrassed to have a so-called waifu like me as companion, at least for a time? It would be the honour of my life. Pierre's breath grew even more ragged with each step. He grabbed by some tug. He was grabbed by some tug of a pedestrian, telling him to apologise for charging through the busy streets. Pierre snarled at the young man, flashing his sword to scare the youth off before bolting it once more down the last few streets. Did you ever tell her how you felt? Pierre rounded the last bend, almost collapsing against the nearest wall for support. He had made it. Everything hurt, every bone in his body complained, every ligament stretched and screamed, but he had made it. And there she stood, the girl with the silky white hair flowing freely, the girl with the infinitely deep, swirling brown eyes. She stood in the same old stupid park. They hadn't even really spent that much time there, and yet Pierre couldn't help but feel a strange affinity for the place. The place they'd had their first real argument, the place they'd watched children play ball, and the sun setting, the place of their first date. Mocker stood a little ways in front of the chip van, the one between the two small park benches and the great old beech tree. She stared all around, glancing up at the stars and twirled. It reminded Pierre of something out of an old classic film noir, her face lit by the street lamps as she took it all in one last time. The city, the moon and stars, the park. He simply stood watching for a few moments, dazzled by how strangely beautiful such a mundane sight could be. And then she stopped nodding to herself as though resolved and content with her last look at the world of Earth. It took all he had to start moving again, 
to will his feet to take one step after the other, to make his vocal cords cry out once more. Maka! She turned to face the sound of his voice, her hair fluttering behind her, her eyes glistening with a teary sparkle, altogether too cliché, altogether too real. What are you doing here? Me? What about you, eh? Pierre, please, it has to be this way. Says who? Artig or Maka? What? Pierre, the letter. We're one and the same. Didn't you read it? You already knew. I think you always knew. There is no way back for you, Pierre. And, and I'm sorry. So what? You're just giving up? Who cares about the damn letter? Now who says that? Pierre or Jem? Pierre shook his head ruefully, still pacing slowly to close the distance between him and Maka. Those are names, girl. The person is only one man. Then why did you ask me? Intent, woman! Everything has intent. Every action, however small, always means something. Even if the meaning is as simple as none at all. Pierre, you're not making any sense. I ask what part of you wishes for this, hey? What part of your personality demands we part like this? Because I don't believe it's either. I don't think the excitable mocker or the lonely Arctic wishes this. Tell me I'm wrong! Mocker's cheeks dripped now with tears as she shook her own head. It doesn't matter. This is our end, and I'm sorry, Pierre, but goodbye. She turned with a flourish, and in a single awful instant, a wet white speck of appeared, then opened and swarmed and spread and burned its way into reality. In the space before Ardic now stood a tower, white oval of blistering light. Air reached with all his remaining muster and grabbed her hand. I won't leave you to your fate a second time, you hear me? The tears poured from her pained face. There is no other way, Pierre. Don't make this so sad. Today is a happy day. It's the day you leave your old life behind and, and move on. And what about you? Silence. Tell me, Pierre, if this was one of your stories... This isn't one of my damn books. But what if it was? How would it end, Pierre? A tale of a beautiful woman appearing before a lonely man locked away in his house. How would that story end? Mark, tell me... Pierre's grip on her hand loosened a fraction. I, I suppose the girl would show the man a better way to live. R remind him of the world's wonders. Show him life is worth living again. And then? Well? And, and then the girl would probably turn out to have been a, a ghost or a dream or maybe a spirit of some former lover. They would, they would disappear, leaving the man hoe up broken for a time but able to live. But Maka, she freed herself from his grip and took another step forward. Pierre followed suit, grabbing her firmly but carefully by the shoulders. I told you, didn't I? This isn't some stupid book. For son's sake, Pierre, there is no other way. This planet has no magic, but that's what's in your head. No way to get you home, just what you can remember. And what if I just step through, straight through that portal, right now? Marcus' face took on a mix of anger and shock. You'd never be so stupid. Chances are you might just step through and nothing would happen. But equally, what if you get sent somewhere random, teleported into deep space to suffocate and freeze alone? But you're wrong. There is magite on this planet, see? He gestured down to their respective swords. Maka leaned in close and gently caressed Pierre's face with her soft hands. That sword is as much a projection as I am. It isn't real. Pierre half chuckled, laying a hand reflexively on his own blade's hilt. Clearly, his wearing a sword was unnoticeably natural in Maka's eyes. My sword, silly, not yours. Bestowed upon me the day your father ordained me a knight of the realm. An honest-to-goodness goth new sword. Maka's face grew ever more pained. She leaned until her forehead matched intermittently with his. It is a sliver of metal. Nothing more. Your letter said for every sword you gain a second or two more here. Why could mine not act as an anchor? For me to step through that gate, back to our world. Yeah, that isn't science. It's desperation. I must go, and you must stay. That is all there is. Says who? How is that fair? Maka pulled back. Fair? When has our life ever been fair, Pierre? We must simply make the best of what we can. But haven't we earned it? Isn't thirty years of being alone enough? Haven't we goddamn earned one happy ending for once in our blasted lives? Maka smiled through the tears staining her face, her body backlit by the glow of the portal behind. She smiled as broadly as one can imagine, while Pierre spoke his final words. I, I, I love you, Ardig. I have always loved you. And I will always, always love you.
Arig stepped forward into the light, and Jem Havre followed one short step behind her. Epilogue. Three Tales Converge. Final chapter. I just don't understand it, lad. Nothing about this case makes any damn sense. Rich, successful man suddenly turns his house into a fireworks platform, attacks a half dozen police officers, and then disappears into thin air, exclaimed an older, balding man in a heavy set trench coat. Beside him stood a second, similarly aged individual, wearing a scruffy anorak and rounded glasses. Not to mention the complete lack of his stray foot, man, he said in a tick Norden accent. No matter how hard we dig, we can't find anything. No family, no birthplace, nothing. The two stood in front of an old London townhouse, one now surrounded with yellow police tape and squad cards. And what are his motives? I hear all we have, you know, a midlife crisis, and you especially, no offence, Lane. None taken, Chief. But no, the man showed no signs of that sort. Rumours say he'd even got himself a new partner. There's just no sense to this case. Hey up, here comes trouble, said Lane, gesturing his head behind them. Approaching them was a tanned woman with long shoulder black hair, dressed in a pristine suit dress, a lanyard around her neck identifying her as Dr. Fern Sheeker. Gentlemen, what progress? she asked with a tone of authority. The two men simply shrugged. A scrowl came across the good doctor's face. Chief Inspector Halford, you cannot honestly expect me to believe there has been no movement anywhere in almost 24 hours. Halford sighed. CCTV, AMPR, word of mouth, none of it gives us anything. There's no clues in the house either. I've posted alert to, to all the nearby airports and... The nearby? Make it nice and wide, man. Uh, with respect, ma'am, he isn't a high-value target, surely, the Norton detective said back. Sheikah's brows furrowed agitatedly. Inspectors, Pierre Havelock is the highest value target you have ever dealt with in all your lives. He had unrestricted access to almost all data concerning the undercurrent incident. The things in the book are public knowledge, but schematics for the weapons used or the spacecraft seen, those could shift the balance of power in our world, turn Britain back into a superpower. The old man's face alighted at this news. So do you think that's his motive? Take that information and sell it to a foreign power? CIA or the Russians and the Chinese, perhaps? The Chica shook her head doubtfully. Possibly, but no. He has government contracts to document, to arbiter the project for the next ten years. He would have made more money than he could ever desire. This discovery, the things he could have wrote on. The way they will change all our lives very shortly, gentlemen. Will, his legacy would have been forever. He could have lived in literary history for millennia to come, longer than I and my team will for making the discovery, as long as Shakespeare or Dostoevsky even. Why, he would throw such an incredible legacy away? A better office offer? Shrugged the chief inspector. A woman? Grinned Lane, causing Halford to smirk. Dr. Fern Sheeka simply shook her head with disdain. Within the land of Valya, the central planet of the so-called undercurrent solar system, there are a great menagerie of legends and folk tales. Among them, two from around the same time are of some interest to this humble archiver. One is the story known by a great many, the story of Empress Ardig, the greatest ruler of all time, seen by some as a living saint and others as an embodiment of God, and agreed by all to have been the most powerful being to have ever walked the planet's surface. Her empire is said to have lasted a thousand years, the day of her victory proclaimed by many to be the day the first era turned into the second. Even now, the state's union that rules over the third age, millennia later, is still situated on the central continent, still has its home where Ardig's throne room once was. But the end of her tale is most peculiar. By all accounts, near the 30th anniversary of her final victory over the continent, Ardig simply vanished. She left no heirs, nor was there any funeral. She, and supposedly even her golem, simply disappeared. Of course, the politicians spun it well, claimed she had been requested of by the gods, that she would never grow old and die, had ascended to the heavens up above. But in truth, she was never seen again, turned into the legend of the god empress, to be worshipped for all eternity. Conversely, in the land of Avernia, there are thousands of myths about. Foremost of all is surely the legend of Isla and the two great giants. But I would draw attention to a different story, a much lesser known one, in fact. A tale called The Oracle and the Lady. It comes from a small village in the mountain ranges to the south. 
where it is said the families of some of Ardig's loyalist followers retired to after they were finished serving her and carving out the empire. The legend goes that one day a man and a woman arrived at the settlement nestled in the hills. They were quiet folk who kept to themselves at first, building a small home of their own on the edge of the settlement. But in time, they came to be relied upon by all the villagers. They would tell stories together to the children and adults alike, and when wolves or bandits came baying in the night, it is said the lady would turn them away with ease, while the man became known as a renowned sibyl, predicting the weather with deft accuracy, and even saving many lives by foreseeing landslides and rockfalls, often weeks in advance. It is unclear if the two were married or ever had children, but what is known is that they lived out the rest of their days in quiet contemplation there, said to walk the highlands almost every day, always covered in kind smiles for one another as they laughed warmly, beloved and revered by all who saw them. Of course, it is not for this lowly orator to comment on these two tales, on the fact that Ardic's disappearance so closely aligns in date with the arrival of this lady and her oracle. However, as my predecessor used to say, there are no coincidences in stories, just happy beginnings. The end. Thank you for listening. Momentai.